Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, on behalf of the Council for Civil Liberties, I thank you for your attendance here. I'm Michael Cope. I'm the President of the Council. Uh, on behalf of the Council, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. This event will consist of uh, some talks by our two distinguished guests, being Dr Alex Werdek and Mr Mick Palmer, followed by questions. The, the purpose of this event this evening is to um, raise the issue of pill testing and also of uh, drug driving testing. And the, the Council for Civil Liberties position is that the personal possession of drugs, of all drugs, ought to be decriminalised, but in the meantime, and that uh, possession of cannabis ought to be legalised. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we need to deal with the harm which comes from the failure of the current policy of the war on drugs. So what we're here to discuss at the moment is some particular issues arising um, from the war on drugs. Uh, first of all, about pill testing and the need to recognise the fact that people are going to take drugs most of us here are enjoying a nice glass of wine. Why are we doing that? Because we enjoy it. Uh, why are people taking other sorts of drugs? It's mainly because they enjoy it, and that's never going to change. So we need to deal with that reality. But also, the issue of drug driving testing, random drug driving testing, whatever you want to call it, is an important point for the Civil Liberties Council from the point of view of people are being convicted of offences which are in fact not related to, to whether or not their driving is bad, whether or not it's doing anybody any harm, is just because they have in their system a drug, or the remains of a drug, which might have been there for quite a considerable period of time. So <coughs> our first speaker will be Dr Alex Werdek. And Alex is a physician who is the director of the Alcohol and Drug Service at St Vincent's Hospital between 1982 and 2012 when he retired. He is currently the president of the Australian Drug Law Reform Foundation and was president of the International Harm Reduction Association between 1996 and 2004. He helped establish the Safe Injecting Room in Sydney and he is a well-known expert in harm minimisation strategies. He helped establish the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre, the Australian Society for HIV Medicine, and the New South Wales Users AIDS Association. He is, I think this is the second or third time Alex has come to speak at our events. He's always informative and very interesting and brings an approach to these issues which is uh, rational and sensible. Please welcome Alex to the well, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, and thank you to Michael, and thank you to the council. Very pleased to be here. I hope you can all hear me. Mick and I have uh, been talking today about um, at other uh, events um, to the press uh, about the subject of pill testing, um, and indeed ABC Radio in, uh, should be broadcasting something round about now that was uh, recorded earlier today where we gave the subject of pill testing um, quite an airing. Um, and it's uh, a very important subject. It hasn't really been discussed as much, I gather, in Queensland as it has in New South Wales and Victoria. And we desperately need uh, another jurisdiction in Australia to um, uh, allow not just a trial to proceed, but to do the real thing and pass the legislation which um, enables us to be, become part of the, part of the scenery. Um, it's uh, uh, hard to believe that in 2019 we are still discussing the subject of pill testing in Australia. We've been bashing it from pillar to post for five years and it has overwhelming support in the community and it has overwhelming support amongst all of the expert groups and it now has overwhelming support sadly um, amongst parents who've lost kids because their kids went to a youth music event where there was no pill testing and took a drug uh, that turned out 
to end their life prematurely. Um, it's a very important subject, but it's, uh, there are some other subjects, and I hope you'll forgive me if I talk about one of the other subjects I think we really need to uh, start talking about more and more in Australia uh, to do with drug law reform. Um, and it's very much in the spirit of the Council for Civil Liberties. And I'm here talking about roadside drug testing. Now, all of these social policy reforms, and they are, that's exactly what they are, take a very, very long time to, to happen. Uh, the New South Wales Parliament, in its wisdom, uh, is uh, considering the issue of decriminalising abortion. Um, I was a young person in the 1960s. Um, some other people here today would probably uh, also fit that description. Uh, and in the 1960s, um, uh, Dr. Bertram Weiner started campaigning for uh, making abortion legal. Um, and uh, he had attempts on his life. He had um, multiple attempts on his life uh, by people who had a different view. And nowadays, uh, in Australia, uh, five states and two territories, I gather, uh, abortion is no longer a crime. New South Wales is the last, and now there are 15 members of the New South Wales Parliament across all the major and some of the minor parties as well that want to put an end to this in New South Wales. The law hasn't been enforced uh, for decades in New South Wales. Um, why do I mention this? I mention this to remind you that uh, these reforms take a hell of a long time. Uh, and that means they need persistence. So the people who are, you're not going to like me saying this, the people in this audience here tonight who are young, you are going to have to carry the burden of arguing for drug law reform for a long, long time. The things that everyone in this room wants to see happen are not going to happen quickly, none of them. And so what all of us who think this issue is important have to do is we have to argue this um, all our life. And then when we're close to the end, we have to pass the baton on to young people and they have to argue it all their life. And then when they get to the same stage uh, near the end, they have to pass the baton on to others. It's, it's not a marathon, it's a, re it's a marathon relay. And that's why I want to talk about roadside drug testing, because we haven't really begun the conversation of roadside drug testing. Uh, I presume everyone here knows what roadside drug testing is. It began in the state of Victoria in Australia, first jurisdiction in the world, 2004. And the technology of drug testing had improved considerably. Victoria passed legislation which allowed uh, drug testing to take place and the test was to find out whether the driver of a car had detectable quantities of any one of three drugs cannabis and the drug tested was delta 9 tetra cannabinol uh, methamphetamine and ecstasy to which New South Wales in its wisdom has added cocaine so New South Wales tests for four drugs all the others test for three. And um, I think the last jurisdiction to um, complete the picture for this national approach was the ACT. That was um, about seven or eight years ago. Um, uh, so there's a whole protocol for testing. The testing protocol differs from state to state, but what I said uh, doesn't vary amongst the states. No state requires any proof of impairment of the driver to uh, uh, allow a conviction to be recorded. And there are savage penalties for uh, conviction. Uh, and the penalties are far more savage than the penalties that apply, justly in my view, for the uh, equivalent amounts of alcohol in people who are found to be um, driving a vehicle and uh, uh, into, and having a uh, high range PCA or moderate range or low range um, prescribed concentration of alcohol while they're driving. Now, the, in the case of alcohol, uh, the science is clear. Um, 
famous study that was done, I believe, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, showed in the 1960s a clear correlation between blood alcohol concentration and the risk of a road crash. Uh, then studies showed that, uh, that the concentration of alcohol in the breath was highly correlated to concentration of, of uh, alcohol in the blood. And then this, the, the science of this and the technology Im improved uh, and eventually random breath testing was introduced in Australia um, and that also became uh, a nationwide pro um, legislation uh, in each state and territory and it reduced uh, the road crashes by about a third. Australia has done spectacularly well in making our roads safer but they can never be <coughs> safe enough as far as all of us are concerned. All of us are road users, all of us want to see safer roads, and random breath testing for alcohol did that in spades. Uh, there, of course, there have been attempts to challenge random breath testing legislation in the courts, and they have failed. Um, it stands up scientifically, it stands up ethically, and it stands up legally and I'm not one to criticise it in any way. Random, the roadside drug testing was built on the, on the comparison with random breath, test, random breath testing, but it fails scientifically, fails legally, and it fails ethically. And what it does do, and we can guarantee you on this, what it does do is that it punishes innocent drivers and it punishes them very severely and uh, we we should always take what the state does to us very seriously when the state punishes us its citizens for wrongdoing um, that's a very important function of the state and the state has got to get that right and that's why we give a lot of resources to parliaments, not just in Australia, worldwide, to get the legislation right. We give a lot of resources to the court system to make sure that this system is just and fair and that it is based on proper science. And random breath testing is all of those in spades. But roadside drug testing is not. What I want to do is I want to suggest the next step and then I'll tell you what, the, the ways in which roadside drug testing fails us. So then what's the next step? The next step is I think that we need to have a parliamentary inquiry. Uh, I'm, I'm fine about us discussing this here, but it's not gonna change anything. What could change something is a parliamentary inquiry. So I hope you will talk about this and write about this, especially discuss this with your members of parliament and try and get somewhere in Australia at least one parliamentary inquiry into roadside drug testing. Let the advocates of roadside, roadside drug testing have their say in a forum, an open forum. Let the critics have their say and let's decide, uh, the parliamentarians decide, how it stacks up and whether there needs to be any kind of review. Roadside drug testing was, was uh, sold to the public as a safety, road safety initiative, and it isn't a road safety initiative. To my knowledge, uh, it has never been evaluated in Australia to see whether it actually does make our roads safer. Um, uh, so um, that's the remedy. Now, what's wrong with roadside drug testing? Well, firstly, I think we're testing the wrong drugs. Uh, it's true that some drugs do impair driving and do increase road crash deaths and do and that risk is quite a considerable increase. It's not a small risk at all. And here I'm talking about prescription drugs. Uh, so I'm talking about members of the opioid family, uh, benzodiazepines, which we would know from, all would know from trade names like Serapax and Valium. Uh, Antihistamines, they now have, we've now had several generations of antihistamines and the more recent ones have less impairing effect than the <coughs> earlier generations, 
but the earlier ones are still in use. Um, and there is a long list of other drugs that impair the ability of a driver to drive safely and therefore impair the ability of pedestrians, other car drivers, people riding bicycles to uh, live out their lives in full. <coughs> so we're testing the wrong drugs. What about the drugs that we are testing? Um, now, the testing, the evaluation, the research evaluation of impairment of driving by drugs is carried out in three different ways. Uh, firstly, uh, computer simulation. We put uh, somebody in front of a computer. We have uh, a, comp a simulation of driving, a, bit, a little bit like a video game, and we can specifically one by one test different components of a driver's skill. Uh, uh, so divided attention, um, um, uh, responding quickly to emergencies, those, all of those things can be tested one by one at a time very accurately. The second way that uh, we evaluate potential impairment by drivers is putting uh, drivers on what amounts to a racetrack, so it's not open to the public, there are no ordinary cars on the track, the, the, the vehicle is uh, uh, filled with instruments which measure a lot of the same things that we measure at the computer. But the difference is it's in the real world and the person is actually driving a moving vehicle. The third way that we test uh, for potential impairment is the real world, collecting epidemiological data. And this whole area um, was advanced uh, um, 20 years or so ago by uh, there'd always been a difficulty particularly with cannabis to try and establish um, whether the presence of cannabis was the cause of impairment by the driver so uh, what the Victorian researchers uh, devised was a system of getting data from a whole lot of road crashes where the presence or absence of cannabis in the driver's blood at the time of death was known, um, and separating out the drivers with cannabis and the drivers without cannabis. And then a separate group of researchers will look at the accidents to see whether the cause of the accident was pilot error, driver error, or whether, the, whether there was some other explanation, um, and whether the the car had bald tyres and the driver was driving on a wet, rainy night and the car had skidded out of control, that sort of thing. Um, or whether there'd been a tyre blowout at high speed, that sort of thing. Uh, and so those kinds of studies um, were carried out and the authors of those studies concluded that, the, that in the car crashes where the driver had cannabis um, in his or her blood, uh, that there was a higher risk of a, uh, a driver error crash rather than a mechanical crash compared to the, the, um, uh, the other kind of crashes. Uh, that's now contested, but this is, this is the evidence that is considered for every different kind of drug, not just cannabis. Um, now, in the case of cannabis, there's still a debate amongst um, uh, experts in the area. I'm not an expert in the area, but the US Department of Transport is on the record, reviews this evidence uh, periodically, and uh, it's, it's on the record of being agnostic on the question of whether cannabis impairs um, driver's ability such that the driver um, is more likely to have a road crash. That's the US Department of Transport. And you can look that up on the internet, and I hope you do. Um, other people argue that the case is settled and cannabis does increase the risk of a road crash. Other people argue that it doesn't. Um, but even those who argue that it does increase the risk of a road crash, the increase is fairly small. 
in the case of the prescription drugs that I mentioned, the opiates, benzodiazepines, first generation antihistamines, and there's many other drugs, um, the, the risk is not small. The risk is quite considerable. Um, in the case of methamphetamine, methamphetamine is uh, prescribed by doctors in the United States. It's not prescribed, it's not allowed to be prescribed by doctors in Australia. Methamphetamine is given by the United States Air Force to some of its pilots when they're flying actual missions to get them to be able to stay awake and concentrate longer. So people on uh, pilots on war missions in, say, Afghanistan or Syria, um, in, a, in a confined little space of a jet for six or eight hours, fairly monotonously flying at high speed, um, uh, easy to get bored, they're given uh, methamphetamine to help them concentrate better, and some argue that this makes them more aggressive. There's a debate about that as well. Um, and in the case of ecstasy, there is, I don't know any, anyone who argues that ecstasy, um, MDMA, increases the risk of um, a road crash, and I don't know of that in the case of cocaine either. These things really need to be debated in front of a, um, uh, among experts in front of the parliamentarians um, so that we can get further with them. Um, what's happening though at the moment is that if you have detectable quantities of any of those four substances in New South Wales, three substances in the other states and territories, uh, you will be convicted just on the presence of detectable quantities. How much is a detectable quantity? Well, the, some of the this information is available on uh, the transport department's website in the different states and territories, and some of them are pretty coy about uh, establishing what that actual concentration is. But the concentration is not tied to impairment. It's just a question of whether the, the, the substance was detectable in your blood, or initially in your um, saliva, in your oral fluid, as they say in, the, in this legislation, or not. Um, so are we testing for the right drugs? I think the answer is no. Is it right that we are only testing for detectable uh, biological concentration and not testing for impairment? Well, I think that's clearly wrong, unless, as in the case of alcohol, a concentration of alcohol is clearly tied to impairment, which we know from epidemiological studies and we know from physiological studies. So here we have a second area for concern. We also have concern that um, the, the testing system was introduced on a false premise. The false premise was that the testing would be random. It's not random and in recent years the, the ministers in going around the country and selling this policy have uh, stopped arguing that it is random. If you have a test which is positive, your registration number of your car will go into the um, computer system and your car will be picked out um, and you will be tested uh, again. Um, that's not random. And the police even admitted uh, earlier on in the case that if you were driving an old battered car with a foxtail flying from a radio aerial, um, uh, and a young male driver, um, you would be uh, much more likely to be tested than if you were driving, driving a, uh, an elderly female as driving a late model BMW or Mercedes. Um, they wouldn't be tested. Um, so it, it never has been random. Um, we don't know whether it affects road safety or not. Um, uh, we also don't know whether the this whole system is cost effective. That is, whether you, the taxpayer, are getting uh, value for your hard-earned taxpayer's money. Um, uh, we do know that roadside drug testing is very much more expensive than alcohol testing. Much less effective, I would argue, but way more expensive. Uh, to the extent of 
a hundred times more expensive or two hundred times more expensive, that kind of figure. And the government departments struggle to find the funds to allow this system to go ahead. So there are reports that the budget for uh, random breath testing for alcohol is being cut in order to fund the, the budget for the roadside drug testing. Uh, we've never had that confirmed. If that is the case, that the money to allow this to go ahead is being taken from uh, alcohol road breath, uh, roadside breath testing, uh, then that is an absolute scandal. Uh, and that would certainly make our road use much more dangerous rather than making it safer, as well as depleting our pockets because this is a poor use of taxpayers' funds. So there are, uh, are many uh, questions that need to be asked. They need to be asked in the media, they need to be asked in a parliamentary inquiry, and perhaps some of the things I've said just now can be and should be contested, but the place to do that is <coughs> out in the public, in the arena, uh, where, the, where the whole public can uh, judge this. Um, because what's happening at the moment is very heavy penalties are going to, I believe, innocent drivers. Uh, and this is one thing that should never happen. I'm not a lawyer, uh, Mr Cope is, and I think all lawyers are trained that it's better that um, 10 guilty people are let free rather than one innocent person is punished. And this is the principle that's at stake here. Um, is also the principle that we should, in fact, be uh, have uh, laws that are making our roads safer. Now, what does work in terms of road safety? When I was a young lad, um, say in 1970, there were 30 road crash deaths in Australia every year for every 100,000 Australians. And in my generation, growing up, um, in the 60s and 70s, it was very common to know somebody who'd lost their life in a road crash. We all knew of such people. We all knew of people who had been severely injured in road crashes. Uh, it was carnage on the roads. Um, so what is the road crash death rate in Australia, given that it was 30 per 100,000 per year in 1970? Now in Australia, it's less than five. And we have, uh, this is one of the great public health triumphs in Australia, unfortunately not given the attention it's deserved and the people who allowed this to happen, made this happen, should really be um, applauded. It's a terrific achievement. It saved many, many lives. It saved billions and billions of dollars. It's prevented a lot of misery. It wasn't done by one thing. Um, it was done by a range of things, and that's usually what happens in the drugs area. When we do make advances, it's not one panacea or a silver bullet that's responsible. Usually we do a lot of clever things. So what are the clever things that were done with, roads, with um, road crash deaths to reduce deaths and injuries on the roads in Australia? Well, um, I, I will answer that in a moment, but first I want to put to you that in the drugs area, by contrast, when we try and reduce the, the cost of illicit, illicit drugs in Australia, we put all of our money, almost all of our money, into reducing the use of drugs, rather than reducing the harm that drugs or drug policy <coughs> can cause. Uh, in the case of road crash deaths and severe injuries, road usage has risen from over the last 50 years in Australia, it's now dropping a little bit, but car ownership has gone up. The number of passenger kilometres travelled by each person in Australia has gone up. Again, that's gone down a little bit in the last five or ten years. However you want to measure it, road utilisation by car has gone up considerably in the last half century. So road usage has gone up, <coughs> and yet Road crash deaths and severe injuries have gone down. And again, this is powerful, a powerful argument for harm reduction. So when people say to you, oh, but if you do that, 
drug use might go up. Think about this analogy with cars and think about the fact that, well, would it be so bad if drug use went up in Australia as a result of some new policy, but the health, social and economic costs of drugs went down at the same time? And here's a case in terms of cars where this actually happened. So how was harm reduced um, from cars? Uh, and the answer is many things, and one of them was the random breath testing that I mentioned, but there are many others. Um, roads are being much better designed than they were uh, 50 years ago, and areas where they're uh, particularly prone in the traffic system uh, for uh, an, uh, an extreme number of road crashes, so-called black spots, are being designed out of the system. They're identified and then the traffic engineers design a different way to, uh, to design the roads in that area so that the, the black spot is removed. So that's another way. And another way is that you may have noticed, those of you who have been driving as long as I have, that the road signs uh, are much bigger and much better illuminated than they used to be. That's been a great help. The cars have been designed and the cars have been designed so they crash into other vehicles less often. Um, and if they do crash into a vehicle or an object or a pedestrian or a cyclist, um, if they do, that the occupants of the vehicle are less likely to be injured in the secondary collision within the vehicle. So the whole interior of the vehicle has been softened. We, we use softer materials. We don't have pro things projecting out that people can get impaled upon on the inside of cars or on the outside of cars. So car design has been improved a lot. Uh, uh, the speed of car travel has also been, with some difficulty, reduced. The whole range of things, I, won't, I don't have the relevant expertise. I know about many of these things. I'm not an expert in that area. But the big message is that harm reduction was everywhere. And I want you, over the next few weeks, as you travel around Queensland, I want you to have a look at all the harm reduction that goes into road safety. And those of you who object to harm reduction, you'll, f you'll see that harm reduction is everywhere in the roadside. You'll see that the big concrete pillars that used to exist right next to the road to hold up lighting or something, and if you crashed into that concrete pillar, you were certain to die, or if you survived, you were certain to have severe injury. Well, wherever possible, those concrete pillars have been brought back away from being adjacent to the road, and they've been replaced not by another concrete pillar, but by what the engineers call a frangible pole. And a frangible pole means it's energy absorbing. Your car crashes into that pole and the pole will absorb some of the energy of that crash. Um, in New South Wales, and I presume this is the same in Queensland, where I come from in New South Wales, we often see these days that the beginning of a road division, uh, a steel road division that divides one carriageway from another carriageway, the beginning and end of that are made out of yellow plastic. And they're made out of yellow plastic, one, so that the driver can see it even in rain and unpleasant circumstances, but also so if that car crashes into that beginning or the end of that road dividing system, that the car, that the plastic will absorb some of that energy and the driver and the occupants of the car will not be killed or severely injured. So um, harm reduction's everywhere in road safety and there is no uh, argument about it. I should have mentioned much earlier car seat belts, which saved a lot of lives and which Australia had a big role in helping to develop. And we were the first country in the world to make car seat belts compulsory. And there's very high compliance with the wearing of car safety belts, as there should be. Um, uh, the Declaration of Independence in the United States has this magical phrase, the consent of the governed. Well, the governed certainly give their consent to the car seat belts which were introduced in Australia.
And when they did come in, people argued against car seat belts. My professor of physiology, Pansy Wright, as he was called, R.D. Wright, later the Dean of Medicine at Melbourne University, believe it or not, argued against car seat belts. He thought car seat belts would make the drivers feel safer and therefore they would drive faster and more recklessly and that there wouldn't be any net benefit. Um, well, he was wrong and he was proved wrong in his lifetime and he um, accepted that. Um, uh, these days, the psychologists, always experts at coming up with wonderful language, fancy language, call this, the, call this phenomenon the risk compensation hypothesis. And the risk compensation hypothesis says that all of us um, think about our levels of risk that we can bear to cope with, and we keep those, that risk level at a certain level, and if the world changes so that the, uh, the chances of adverse consequences of our risk behaviour decrease, uh, then we will compensate by increasing our level of risk. That's what the risk compensation hypothesis says. Uh, and it's not an unreasonable hypothesis, and for that reason, every new harm reduction intervention should always be evaluated rigorously and independently before and afterwards to see that it actually has reduced risk. Well, there's no doubt uh, that, uh, that road crash deaths and injuries were decreased by seat belts as they were by airbags, although, remember this, although some people wearing car seat belts died or got severely injured because they were wearing seat belts. That happens as well. The, the net effect <laughs> is clear. The net effect is a huge saving in life <coughs> and a reduction in serious injury, even though there may be occasional people killed. And if we go to the example of pill testing, same thing happens. It may be, um, and I'm sure it will be, of net benefit to uh, young people, saving a lot of lives, preventing a lot of hospital admissions because less people are getting seriously ill. Um, but there may be occasions when somebody is persuaded that this thing is, that because the pill has been tested, it's 100% safe, and unfortunately it, it isn't, it, and won't be 100% safe even if um, it has been tested. So we can learn a lot about drug harm reduction from looking at other kinds of harm reduction. And harm reduction is everywhere. Um, and it's particularly um, ever-present, particularly ubiquitous in the area of road safety. Many other areas as well. I mentioned that sometimes um, reducing harm uh, can inadvertently uh, increase risk behaviour, this risk compensation hypothesis that I mentioned. What are some examples of that? Well, all of us in this room, I hope, um, take out insurance, including fire insurance. And some people who take out fire insurance neglect their properties that they used to look after with particular care. And some people not just neglect their properties, but would rather collect the insurance than have the property, so they set fire to the property or have somebody else set fire to the property, a crime we know as, I believe, as arson. So um, sometimes harm reduction in certain contexts has risks and we should acknowledge that. Um, but the, the test is always to evaluate new policies, evaluate them rigorously and independently, and in the case of drug harm reduction, the case is unarguable that drug harm reduction has been a huge win for the public. It's been a huge win for people who use drugs and their families and their communities and the taxpayers. Everyone has won. Just think of the drug harm reductions that have been introduced in the last 30 or 40 years in Australia. Uh, methadone treatment is a form of harm reduction in the sense that the person is not drug free, um, they've still got an opiate in their blood system, but they've got a much higher chance of not dying from a drug overdose, not committing crime, not getting HIV, looking after their ageing parents better, looking after their 
partner better, looking after their children better, getting a job, getting education, getting training, being um, a fully functioning member of the community. All of those go up with methadone treatment. The needle syringe program, in the first decade of this century, the Commonwealth Department of Health commissioned an independent study to evaluate the needle syringe program and it was estimated that in that 10 year period, 2000 to 2009, in a study that's called uh, Return on Investment, it was estimated that uh, about 33,000 uh, uh, HIV infections were prevented, about 100,000 HIV, sorry, 33,000 HIV infections were prevented, 100,000 hepatitis C infections were prevented, that this, there was a saving, wait for this, a saving of 2.4 to 7.7 .7 billion dollars, and that's billion with a B. Pretty big saving. Um, and the cost to the taxpayer, 200 million dollars. So hugely cost effective. Um, uh, uh, other examples of drug harm reduction in Australia that have been hugely successful, well, the Medically Supervised Injecting Centre, we still only have two, we should have many more than that, we should have at least a dozen, maybe more than that. Uh, we don't need them everywhere, we need them where there are drug overdose hotspots and where the community accepts them. Uh, but the two now in Sydney and one in North Richmond in Melbourne have been hugely successful. Um, uh, uh, and I could go on, um, there are other harm reduction interventions that need to be uh, identified and applauded. Um, but the roadside drug testing uh, it, it doesn't need to be applauded. What it needs to be is needs to be reviewed, needs to be taken apart and closely examined. And it's been around for almost 15 years. It's high time that that was carried out. Um, let me also remind you that some of the people who get disadvantaged by roadside drug testing are the people who are these days in Australia allowed, lawfully allowed to have medicinal cannabis. Uh, we still haven't sorted out the, the, the contradiction between that policy and the policy of roadside drug testing. So some of those people get severe penalties. Uh, they shouldn't, in my view. Some of these uh, elderly people with life-threatening conditions, distressing symptoms, living in r r uh, rural or remote Australia, absolutely dependent on their car for groceries, banking, seeing the doctor, whatever, seeing their friends even. Um, so these people get picked up, roadside <coughs> drug tested. Well, being elderly, not many of them will be tested, but some of them will be. Um, and they will get those draconian penalties that I mentioned before. That's yet another reason we should be having a look at this policy. Um, I'm happy to answer questions, Michael. Um, maybe we could do that later on. I was going to think we would do it at the end, yes. Yeah. yes. And uh, I hope you found this of interest, and I hope you'll, you'll badger your Member of Parliament. Please, can we have a parliamentary inquiry uh, in more than one state and territory into roadside drug testing in Australia? Thank you very much.